Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Kranzow, talking to you today about advances in hip and knee surgery. I'm uh, practicing in Boca Raton from Golden Orthopedics. And we're gonna discuss different techniques we use and advances we've made in different types of hip and knee replacement and other types of surgery. I did my, a little bit about me. I did my uh, residency and fellowship in New York, North Shore Long Island Jewish Hospital. I did my fellowship at Lenox Hill Hospital. I'm a board certified fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon doing sports medicine and a lot of robotic surgery. We're going to talk a lot today about different techniques related to hip and knee problems, from the simple joint pain and common causes of hip and knee surgery, different treatment options from non-surgical all the way to surgical treatment, and how things like joint replacements work, and different techniques like the Mako robotic arm assisted surgery and how that works. We know that our joints are involved in almost every activity we do, like walking and bending. They require the use of your hip and knee joints, and a diseased or injured hip or knee can severely limit the amount of ability of your ability to work or do different activities on the move. Joint degeneration can, it can be constant pain or it can come and go. It can occur with movement or with rest. It can be in one spot or in different parts of your body. You're not just isolated to having one type of problem. You can have a hip and a knee problem or one or the other. Different causes of joint pain that I deal with, a very common cause, maybe one of the most common causes called osteoarthritis. It's a degenerative arthritis where our, our joints wear out. And this condition is a wearing away of the cartilage and you end up with the bones rubbing together uh, creating a lot of inflammation and pain. Arthritis is one of the nation's most common causes of disability. It affects greater than 30 million Americans. And that's a, you know, about 10% of our population that actually get treated for this problem. So you know it's a huge problem. Things like rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition that attacks our joints, is less common and luckily becoming less common as we develop better treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and it's about 1.5 million people in the United States that have that. This is the difference uh, in looking at a healthy or an arthritic knee joint. The knee joint is really made of the two bones of the lower leg, the femur bone and the tibia bone. The femur, the thigh bone, the tibia bone, and the shin bone, and where they meet in the middle is covered in cartilage. And as you develop arthritis, that cartilage becomes worn away, and you end up with bone showing and can be rubbing on either side where the bone rubs on bone that causes severe pain and disability. These are the x-rays looking at a normal knee and an arthritic knee. On the left, we have the normal knee where you have different good spaces between the knee joint. The knee joint uh, cartilage is not visible on an x-ray, so it shows up as an empty space. And when we're looking on the right at the arthritic knee, we can see that there's some empty space on one side, but on the other side, all what we call on the medial side, there's bone rubbing on bone. There is no extra space, so there's no cartilage in that area to cushion the knee. This is this very similar thing in the hip joint. We have the pelvic bone and the femur bone, the ball and socket of the femur. And when you have a healthy femur and hip joint, there's nice smooth cartilage covering the hip and pelvic bones. And when you develop arthritis, that cartilage wears away and you end up with bone rubbing on bone that causes pain and deformity. And this x-ray shows that exact thing where you have a ball and a socket and the socket has a nice space in between so the ball isn't rubbing on the socket on the left side and on the right side that bone is rubbing on the bone and we know the cartilage has worn away. So post-traumatic arthritis can develop from after an injury if you had a skiing accident or a sports accident when you were growing up or in your middle ages we know that that can lead to arthritic problems in joints uh, as you get older. If you had a fracture or a ligament injury, we know that that can cause deformity and pain and arthritic problems down the line. So what types of uh, questions do people often ask me when they have hip pain? Things like pain in the groin or in the buttocks or the lower back, could that be hip arthritis? The answer is of course yes. But Sometimes patients don't always feel pain. Is it normal to not always feel pain? Yeah, most people don't always feel pain. Usually with certain activities or motions, patients feel more pain related to an arthritic joint. 
And what about, why does my hip pain wake me up at night? We know that it's a phenomenon in arthritis related to the inflammation that pain it can often be worse at night than during the daytime. So that can be a real problem with arthritic problems. Knee pain can cause pain in my back, in my hip, down my leg. It can do all of those things and be attributed to knee arthritis. So what non-surgical treatment options? Well, I'm not spending a lot of time talking about the non-surgical treatment options, but if patients come and see me in the office, a majority of the time that I spend speaking with them is about the non-surgical options. I would say about 80% of my patients never need surgery. They go through and they have a non-surgical management of their hip or knee problems, and they never need surgery. So there's a lot we can do to treat these problems non-surgically. One of the biggest things that we can impact is how we eat and how we exercise. We know that losing weight is a huge improvement, causes a huge improvement in arthritic symptoms. And that's because our body feels weight increased in our knee joints, and especially uh, our knee joints, also in our hip joints. So for every extra pound of body weight that you feel, your body feels about four times that amount as you take a step. So if you have 10 extra pounds, your body is feeling 40 extra pounds every step that you take. And we know that that number is different when you're walking up and down stairs, that's actually 10 times the amount. So if you have 10 extra pounds, every step you're going up and down, your body feels 100 extra pounds. So that being able to lose weight, being able to lose just a few pounds, your body will notice a huge difference in the discomfort related to arthritic symptoms. Walking aids like canes or walkers um, can really help offload a joint because you're putting less stress on the knee joint or the hip joint. And different uh, braces or, uh, or assistant devices make a huge difference in your ability to active, uh, actively perform things like walking or sports, and they can help you deal with an arthritic joint heat, ice. I actually prefer ice as my preferred treatment for topical anti-inflammatories. I think if you put a good ice pack on that knee a couple times a day or on your hip, I think it helps significantly. Some patients prefer heating pads, and I tell them whatever makes them feel better I think is something to try. Physical therapy or exercise can be really helpful. Uh, it strengthens the muscles around knees, around the hip to get you active and exercising, which we know can help put off a joint replacement or surgery related to arthritis. Different exercises that are pushing or pulling exercises can be really helpful in getting the muscles stronger. Patients always ask me, what about walking? Are you allowed to walk? You absolutely are. I definitely recommend walking on a daily basis uh, on a daily schedule, I think it can be really beneficial, but it does not fix the problems that we have. If you have knee arthritis, it's not the same thing as doing a physical therapy program. I love walking, but it doesn't fix things. Medications like anti-inflammatory or pain medications can be really helpful in decreasing the inflammation around a joint. Knee problems, hip problems can definitely get uh, improvement with an anti-inflammatory medication. We have to recognize that some people can't take them. There are different interactions with different medications. So definitely something you want to speak to your doctor about. The other thing we often focus on are different types of injections, things like cortisone injections or gel or lubricant injections, different types of uh, biologic injections. These injections are the mainstay of treatment for a lot of patients with joint problems and can be beneficial uh, in treating symptoms of arthritis. We know we can't do these all the time and it takes uh, a couple uh, days to weeks to really have these medications kick in, uh, but can be really helpful in trying to put off needing surgery for these problems. So once we have established that you need more treatment than the non-surgical means. When do we consider a joint replacement? When do you need to talk to your doctor about getting a hip or a knee replacement? So if the treatments that you have aren't working, 
So if you're an active person and you want to stay active and you haven't been able to play tennis or pickleball or go for walks because your joints are hurting you, and it used to be treated with a cortisone injection or an anti-inflammatory and it's not helping anymore, that's often when we say, you know what, it's time to consider a joint replacement. If the things you're doing aren't working and you're not able to keep the active lifestyle that you want, it's really time to consider a joint replacement. Are you less active because of your pain? Does the joint pain keep you from doing things? Is it affecting your ability to go up or down stairs or walk or be with family? Is it affecting your ability to sleep? These are all questions that we ask when it may be time to need a joint replacement. Well, hip replacement surgery is the second most common joint replacement. Uh, we perform over 300,000 hip replacements in the United States every year, and that number is going up steadily every single year. How it works, well, you have two bones in the hip, the pelvic bone and the femur bone. We uh, remove the ball and reline the socket, so we put a new ball and a new socket to glide together smoothly to make it uh, perform well and hopefully for a very long time. Here's a little demonstration of what a hip replacement does. However your doctor does it, we get into the body and into the hip joint, we cut the ball away, and we cut the acetabulum or the socket away and put a new one in there, a new metal uh, liner and a plastic socket uh, and we put a stem and a new ball in place and we put everything back together to get it gliding smoothly without problems. Hip replacements are a very common and effective surgery and here's another demonstration of a hip replacement. This would be going in surgically and opening the, the skin, moving the muscles to the side, being able to look at the hip joint itself, making sure we expose everything that we need to see. If there's any issues with the bone itself, we can clearly see that as we get down to the appropriate level to look at the bones. We make sure there's no bleeding, there's any blood vessels we tie off and make sure aren't bleeding. And once we can do that, we can move through into the hip joint to visualize the bones of the femur and socket. So once we put all these special retractors in to be able to see the hip joint, we do exactly what we showed. We cut the ball out of the way and we can then access the hip joint very easily by pulling that ball, an old uh, arthritic ball out. We can then take some, whatever soft tissue we need out, clean up uh, using what's called reamers to clean the acetabulum or the socket to get a surface where we can have bone grow in to the new metal socket and then we can implant the new metal socket. Uh, once you do that, it's nice and stable. You put a new plastic liner and can impact that in place. We then access the femur bone and put a new stem into the femur bone to give us stability so that we could attach a new ball so that that new ball can access the socket. And once we can put everything back in place, we know that that works well. Here's a little video and information about robotic hip surgery, where we can use robotic arms and robotic technology to better place our implants so we put everything in exactly the right position. 
we know that when it comes to surgery, millimeters matter. And if we put something in one millimeter in the right direction or one millimeter in the wrong direction, we want to be precise in everything that we do. And we know that robotic technology can make sure that we put everything in the most precise manner possible. When it comes to hip replacements, we can use the robotic technology to map the joint itself and to place our uh, components in the best way. This is done before surgery. We get what's called a CT scan to scan the joint before surgery so that we can upload that to the robotic system to make an appropriate surgical plan. So even before surgery, we know what we're going to be doing, where everything is going to be placed. These are the components of a hip replacement that all go into the patient. And on the day of surgery, after we uh, get into surgery, we map the hip joint to make sure we are exactly where we need to be. We do the parts of the surgery that we always do, removing the ball, placing the new stem, uh, placing the socket, but we do it with the aid of some tactile feedback and 3D mapping of the joint that is done with the robotic arm. The robotic arm can tell within 0.01 millimeters where we are, and that makes sure we don't move one way or the other too deep. Move your hand just a little bit up or down makes a big difference. It makes sure we put our implants in exactly the right position so that we can get the best outcome possible. Moving on to knee replacements, this is a little information on where the arthritis in your knee is and what type of procedure you can get. We can do partial knee replacements to total knee replacements. If you only have arthritis in one small area of the knee joint, we can just do a partial knee replacement and get you up and moving maybe a little bit faster than if we have to replace the entire knee joint. If you have advanced arthritis in more than one area of the knee, sometimes you need what's called a total knee replacement to get you fixed and up and moving as quickly as possible. This is the difference when you have on the left a partial knee replacement. You still have your own tissue. We specifically move one, remove one area of the bone to replace it with metal and plastic to get it moving and gliding smoothly, basically to replace the cartilage that was lost. On the right side, when you have a total knee replacement, that's on patients where they have more advanced arthritis, where it affects more areas of the knee that we can't treat with partial replacements. We can also use robotic technology when it comes to knee replacements. We use robotic arm technology in partial and total knee replacements, once again, to put our components exactly where we want them. We use that same CT scan to make a preoperative plan so we can pl plan the surgery and almost do the surgery before we ever get there. Once we're in the surgery, we map out the knee and take it through a range of motion because every knee with the ligaments and soft tissue around it is a little bit different. This isn't something where we treat any one knee as the same as the one that came before it. Everyone's knee, based on their injuries and their soft tissue and their ligaments and the bones, get treated in an individual basis. Once you remove some of the bone uh, and uh, diseased cartilage, we're then able to uh, put in the new uh, joint, the new uh, metal and plastic uh, of either a partial or a total knee replacement to allow it to glide smoothly uh, together to replace that cartilage that was there. It can restore your natural motion and get you functioning and up and moving soon. Total knees are done in a very similar way using that same uh, robotic arm system. We can get that same preoperative template using that CT scan before surgery. So once again, we can do the surgery before we are ever in the operating room. We know what to expect. If there's anything uh, different about uh, the plan, we can know to play, pay extra uh, attention to a certain procedure, part of the procedure. Uh, once we can get into the operating room, we can balance the knee joint appropriately uh, and, and work from there. Uh, using one of the knee replacements, the Stryker Triathlon, it has a great uh, track record and patients have done very well with this for many, many years. 
It gets excellent range of motion after surgery uh, to get you, uh, the patient, moving as quickly as possible. We know that the accuracy of robotic technology can make this a less painful surgery if we're able to uh, do less cutting because of that we know that patients feel better sooner. We know that putting in the implants exactly where we want them, uh, exactly where they're supposed to be in relation to uh, before surgery as well as during surgery where we can uh, check the balancing of the knee, we know that patients do better quicker with this procedure. There are different types of implants that we use. We use partial knee replacements for the femur and the tibia. We can also resurface the kneecap if we need to. And this uh, shows that we've done, in the United States, we do over 700,000 knee replacements a year. We're getting pretty close to a million knee replacements of the year in the United States alone. Uh, when we deal with common questions uh, related to joint replacements, there are patients that can have allergic reactions to the implants related to a knee replacement. And uh, we know that uh, we can use special implants if there are special sensitivities to metals. Will it set off a metal detector? Probably. We don't do those cards anymore. We, you know, when you go through the airport, it can definitely set off an, a metal detector and you just get the scanned by uh, the TSA. Is the implant heavy? Well, usually a knee replacement, a total knee replacement can weigh about a pound. Maybe it's about a third of a pound more than your actual bone. Uh, so not a significant uh, weight gain if you do get a knee replacement. So different ways that tr technology transforms joint replacement surgery. We've used the Mako robot with really great success in transforming the way we do knee and hip surgery. When we can be as accurate as possible, uh, that accuracy that only a computer and robotic technology can give us, I think we can make every surgery as good as possible. This leaves no patients that uh, are outliers. There's no uh, whoops when it comes to robotic technology. When you're dealing with computers and uh, data, it puts it perfectly every single time. And you know we're not trusting a surgeon to look at a joint and say, I think that looks great. We know that the robotic technology makes it accurate every single time. We discussed earlier that when you get approved uh, for this type of surgery. You get the CT scan before surgery. That allows us to map the knee joint and put it into the robotic technology so that at the time of surgery, uh, we already have a plan of exactly what's going to be done, be it for hip or knee replacement surgery. Uh, once we have that model loaded into the robotic technology, we uh, can manipulate the implants or the knee to put everything in the appropriate position. Uh, same thing with the hip scan. Once you get that CT scan, we can put everything in appropriate position even before we get in the operating room. When you're in the operating room, uh, we map the knee joint or the hip joint to uh, make sure that our preoperative plan gets transferred to that patient so that everything matches and is appropriate uh, when we prepare to do the surgery. And then after surgery, we uh, look and show that our plan is exactly what we ended up with. The same thing is true with knee replacements. We know that these replacements uh, have a great track record, and if we can put them in the best position possible, we know that patients will do well with this surgery. When we talk about this robotic technology, this is not new technology, but it is advancing. The first uh, robotic technology surgery was done with the Mako robot in 2006 and we know that since then almost a hundred thousand hip and knee surgeries have been done with the robotic technology and we know that number is increasing every day. We hope to be at over uh, 500,000 surgeries within the next two years. So we know that this is technology that is being widely used around the country and the world. So People always ask me when we talk about robot. People always ask me that when we talk about robotic surgery, am I sitting on the lounge chair and relaxing when the patients uh, are on the operating room? 
And the answer is no. This is not robotic surgery that I'm operating from across the room. This is robotic assisted surgery. So it's a robotic arm that I am actually holding. And the Mako robot can't perform surgery without me doing it. If I'm not there holding or holding a button uh, or making sure it's in an appropriate alignment or uh, or stepping on a pedal to make the arm move, we know that the sur without the surgeon guiding it, the Mako robot doesn't do anything. Uh, when we recover from surgery, we think that because of robotic technology, our patients are becoming more active quicker. These surgeries can be done from an outpatient surgery so that you're going home the same day of surgery. Some patients stay in the hospital maybe one night. I would say a vast majority of my patients are going home the same day. They want to be home and recovering and doing their exercise and therapy at home. And we know that that can happen well with this robotic technology. Every patient is different or if you need uh, different care or other medical problems, we know that, that every patient is an individual and we factor that in when we make our surgical plan. Things like walking, biking, and swimming, and other uh, low-impact activities are absolutely able to be performed soon after uh, hip and knee surgery. Um, we're talking within three months, I have my patients back playing golf or tennis, certainly walking, uh, and doing all other exercises. Patients can get back to driving within a couple weeks. It definitely takes time, but most patients recover rather quickly. I'm Dr. Michael Kransow. If you have any questions about these procedures or any hip or knee issues, please give me a call here at Golden Orthopedics.